Let's get ready to rumble! Welcome to Boxing Unwrapped. Welcome to Boxing Unwrapped, the most controversial boxing podcast recorded this week. I'm Ryan. I'm Andrew. And uh, this week, guys, we've got a new look for you. We're going to be talking about one specific item in this episode, and we're splitting up our fight review and everything so you can digest our stuff a little bit faster. Uh, Mm. So, Andy, do you want to tell the people what we've got in store in this episode? In this episode, in this episode only, we are focusing on what the F are the greatest controversies in boxing. We're trawling through the annals to find out which indeed are the most shocking of shockiest controversies in all of boxing history time. So, with that in mind, let's jump in to our main topic of the episode, which is what the F are boxing's biggest controversies. There aren't any. Boxing's been controversy three, free since 1703. Oh, man, it, there's nothing. Absolutely, you know, I really <laughs> struggled to find stuff in this episode. <laughs> this episode was more of like... It, the research was more of like an editorial process. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, what do we not put in? What My do we goodness. not put in? So, um, yeah, uh, I'll kick off then, shall I? Which I think is one that, um, <clears throat> you know, I, kind of blew my mind when I, when I read it. Um, and this is Antonio Margarito uh, being uh-huh. caught with plaster in his gloves. Have you ever yeah. seen this, man? I've, I, know this, I know about this specific one. I don't know, like, all of the details. But, yeah, I, I, this is um, <laughs> one way to get some extra punch power. <laughs> Fuck me, man. He could have killed someone. So uh, this is about um, Antonio Margarito. He'd just come off an inspiring 2008 TKO of a previously undefeated Miguel Cotto. Mm -hmm. Uh, The former welterweight champ um, when he met Shane Mosley in January 2009. Now, uh, Mosley's trainer, Nazim Richardson noticed a powdery substance in Margarito's gloves. Mm-hmm. When the substance was then brought to the attention of officials, Margarito was made to rewrap his gloves three times. This was they, they discovered this as they were as his hands were being wrapped like pre fight with, yeah. with the opposite corner watching as it was being done. Absolutely, yeah. So the substance then turned out to be plaster of Paris. Um, which is like, you know, powder that hardens when it's wet. So mm-hmm. obviously when it apply- when you applied it to your hand wraps, the sweat would make the powder harden into like a cast. It looks like it's like something out of a superhero film. Um, what's the one like an adventures or something where there's like a giant rock man? <laughs> it's like... Absolutely. And like in the kind of aftermath of this, everyone is questioned whether or not he did the same thing from with with Cotto as well, and a lot uh-huh. of his other victories, um, because he he was knocked out by Mosley in quite a, a brutal fashion, and then banned from the sport, but only for a year, right? Not like a lifetime ban, uh, yeah, like it's one lenient, year. Yeah. It's incredibly lenient. I mean, like imagine, like I was trying to think of like um, you know comparable. Uh, like sports where you could where you could do something different. And I mean, I guess like at, to the the point where you would actually like detriment someone's life. I I really couldn't think of it. I mean, it maybe like in F one, if you deliberately drove someone into a wall so that like yeah. you could win the race, maybe. But like in that, I mean, you probably would be done with what like culpable homicide or something. Some, yeah, it would be. So, you think it would be pretty severe. I, I was thinking like, imagine you know when they do like a big downhill on the Tour de France, if you got a stick and. <laughs> <laughs> stuck, stuck it through your opponent's front wheel. Absolutely, man. I mean, it's fucking mental, eh? Absolutely mm-hmm. fucking mental. Yeah. Um, w- when the cheating results in, uh, you know, in a disproportionate, when it's actually resulting in, like, physical damage as opposed mm-hmm. to just giving you an advantage, you know, there's a, it's, it's like next level, is it? It's not good. You know, like, and it's not a good um, kind of advertisement for the sport either because you could properly kill someone. I don't I like I I to be honest like I'm very surprised you could continue the sport afterwards. 
Yeah, it, it's just uh, it's beyond strange, really. Uh, and I was going to say that this is you know that this is not um, the first example. So uh, if we go back to, for a very similar similar instance to 1983. The infamous case of Luis Resto versus Billy Joe Collins Jr. Mm-hmm. So uh, Collins Jr. was a highly touted up and coming prospect, and Resto was a was a journeyman with a kind of reasonably mixed record. When they fought at middleweight in uh, in the eighties, and it was expected that Collins would would kind of win and and, and continue his his march upwards uh, towards the the top echelons of the division. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the but they fought and the ten round fight was a unanimous decision victory to Resto, okay. And this was obviously like a bit of a, a bit of an upset. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. the trainer of Collins, his father and trainer Billy Senior, uh, went up to shake Resto's hand after the fight, and he felt something was amiss relating to his glove. So he screamed blue murder, he screamed cheat, and the New York State Athletic Commission impounded the gloves to look in. And on doing so, they found that someone had removed an ounce of padding from each of the gloves and filled them up with chalk. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> yeah. the uh, Something looked amiss just looking at uh, Collins Jr.'s face after the 10-round fight. His it was basically he was swollen shut, um, and he was in a horrific, horrific state. As a result of the injuries during that fight, uh, he ended up with a torn iris, and he had permanently blurred vision. Mm-hmm. He was never, never able to box again. Um, he apparently the the speculation certainly from his father's side was that um, in the months afterwards, while intoxicated, he drove his car, he crashed his car drunk and died. And his father has speculated that it was actually a suicide on the basis of that he'd lost his livelihood, he'd lost his ability to, to earn a living through boxing. And he wouldn't be the first one who tried to commit suicide well, exactly. driving a car into a wall, would he? Exactly. It's quite the... Apart from beating women, boxers seem very have much of a poncho for driving cars into stationary objects at high speeds. Um, so initially, so so basically, as a res- whichever way you cut it, as a result of what Resto and his trainer had done, um, Collins Junior killed himself or or died. Certainly, we know for sure that he died. Whether he killed himself mm-hmm. or not, it's up for debate. But he, but he did die shortly after. Now Resto initially. Uh, denied having any knowledge about the the the, the tinkering to his wraps and mm-hmm. the gloves. He didn't know that, that that had been done, and he said it was just the trainer. But no one really believed him, and he had, both him and his trainer were actually convicted, um, and criminal charges were brought against him. Resto served two and a half years in prison. I think it was like something along the lines of assault with a deadly weapon, i.e., his fists, because. Yeah. You know, because of obviously how they could then be used and, and, and given what the considerations were in terms of how they were being opened up to be more powerful weapons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, later on in his life, he did kind of repent and he, he apologised to Collins's widows and said that he kind of went along with it. His trainer kind of forced him a little bit and he went along with it because he was young. But he actually yeah. admitted that he did know and there were several other instances where the trainer had... Uh, tinkered with the gloves. He also did the soaked his hand wraps in plaster of Paris to harden them for other fights, and he said he also used to slip him uh, asthma drugs that increased his cardio in the very late stages of fights as well. And all of this, all of this was related to uh, bets being placed on him to win. So the fights where he wasn't supposed to win, there was lots of uh, crooked money. Uh, bet on him to win, and these were the the methods in which they ensure that came to pass. Right. Okay. Okay. S- interesting. S- Very interesting. Very sad. Sad stuff. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so he did kind of repent, and I think he's now eventually he's sort of worked as a boxing trainer, and I think he eventually got a license to be a cornerman. Um, <laughs> however many however many years later, <laughs> fucking hell, man! It's a fucking liability that is. Like. Cricky, you wouldn't want to be the opponent, would you? Yeah. I'm not fighting if he's another voice corner. Like, <laughs> I'll get my face caved in. Yeah, totally. 
Uh, well, so, I'm gonna move on, man. Next on my list is probably one of the most famous, I think, uh, uh-huh. because it cuts through like into popular culture, and this is where Mike Tyson bites Holyfield's ear. Yes. I mean, fucking hell, dude. Like, so 1996, Tyson is going to fight Evander Holyfield. This is like the fight, the big one, right? Um, you know, everybody wants to see it. It's like, it's kind of like a, a Ma- Mayweather Pacquiao level fight, you know? I mean, it was uh-huh. super hyped, you know, um, Evander Holyfield was at his prime. Mike Tyson was like kind of coming back and he was like he at this point his screws were a bit loose you know uh-huh. um and they weren't the the say like you know tyson was a declining tyson he lost to the first fight between them um mm-hmm. uh holyfield won by by tko in round 11 um and it you know they they obviously were going to have a, a rematch um and Tyson received a cut, actually, from, from a Holyfield headbutt um, during the second round. Mm-hmm. And he complained to the referee, but the referee apparently did nothing about Holyfield's headbutts during the first match. So it was like a bit of a contentious issue. Yeah. Um, and then in round three, sick of Holyfield's headbutts, he fucking bites off Holyfield's right ear and then, like, spits it out on the fucking, like, um, on the canvas. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> the interesting bit I thought about this, right, is actually Mills Lane, the referee, deducted two pi- points from Tyson, but the bout continued. You, you do wonder. You wonder how many boxers would be willing to fight on after having had their ear bitten off. A lot, of, you know, I, I can imagine a lot of them be like, "Well, hold on a minute." <laughs> exactly. Could you, not have, could you not have disqualified him? Because the thing is, obviously, to bite off the ear, you've got to spit out your gum shield. So it's such a deliberate act, isn't it? It's not like it's not like it's like a headbutt where you know it could possibly happen. Um, you know, a little bit potentially accidentally or not, you know, like a little bit gray area, but like biting someone's ear, it's such a kind of deliberate <laughs> maneuver. It's yeah. Like... Yeah. I know what you mean. Uh, what, what, what's weird as well, right. Is that like, um, you know, the bite, the bout continues. He only got two points deducted mm-hmm. and then, um, Tyson continues to bite the other ear. <laughs> and then like uh he comes over to Holyfield's corner after the round to argue and fight with Holyfield. And mm-hmm. it was at that point that Tyson was fucking disqualified. Right? Or was he not disqualified for the second biting of the ear? No, nah, it was after he fucking starts arguing with uh Holyfield's corner and like and Holyfield and like starts to kind of fight with them in the corner. So, like, then he's disqualified, um, and, you know, ultimately he was, like, he was fined $3 million and -hmm. temporarily banned from the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's not like, I mean, you've bitten someone's ear off, you don't get a lifetime ban. You know what I mean? It's insane. Absolutely (laughs) insane. Yeah, it, it, I, 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 did you find any like precedents? Like, has there ever ever been other occasions where someone's ear has been bitten off? Like, I, I'd be no. curious to know if it's I, happened any other time. I, I, I haven't come across. I, it. I haven't heard of it. I think it's a rare event, actually. Fucking <laughs> mad. <laughs> so, but this remember? I think when we spoke about this briefly before, and uh, the trainer Teddy Atlas had, had sort of. He'd seed, uh, had a vision, he had a premonition that this was what was going to happen. And it was about Tyson um, looking for a way out of the fight because mm-hmm. he knew he couldn't win. So he would do something. He actually said, oh, maybe he'll... Did he, say he, he actually said, oh, maybe he'll bite him or something. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. basically go out of his way to force a disqualification because it was less painful than the alternative mm-hmm. of, of mm-hmm. just being soundly beaten. It, and I, I think that's probably part of it. Shall we move on? Uh yeah, let's move on. I've got one that I think is very, very famous that's worth talking about, but it's really um, how controversial is it? It's known for being controversial, but I'm not sure it actually is that controversial. 
Right. So let's go back to 1926. Oh, let's Jack jump in the time machine. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Dempsey versus Gene Tunney and the f- infamous long count. So, uh, in the seventh round of the fight, both this is like a sort of um, stellar, uh, uber, um, like uber high level um celebrity boxing match this is like the highest level and the highest level of public interest in front of that so we're speaking about i think it's in chicago in front of 105,000 spectators mm-hmm. there wasn't much going on in 1926 so this was pretty exciting but anyway 105,000 spectators dempsey knocks down tunney in the seventh round uh, but doesn't re- retreat quickly to the neutral corner, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Now, it's worth saying that very... I think it was just basically right before the fight, that the or in the training for the fight, the boxers were both told that the referee will not start the count for knockdowns until uh, the, the fighter who's done the knockdown retreats to the neutral corner, as it is today. Yeah. Okay? But this was a new rule at that point, and I don't think they'd been in fights where that was in place before. So, Dempsey knocks down Tunney and then stands over Tunney after having knocked him out. And despite the referee saying to him, you need to go back to the neutral corner, mm-hmm. you need to go back, he, he continues to stand there. And it's only after several seconds that Dempsey finally then retreats to the neutral corner and the count against Tunney begins. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tunney rises, he, he, he rises on nine, but by that point, he's been down for like... 13, 14 seconds. Mm-hmm. Okay? So the the long count is basically that instead of getting his 10, or, you know, his 9 to get up before 10, he got 13 or 14 seconds. But the thing is that they both knew that that was the rule, so it was kind of like, it was uh, Dempsey's kind of fault yeah. that he didn't, uh, he should have retreated and then, and then it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of course, the thing with this specifically is that um, there's two things that are interesting. Dempsey obviously went on to lose the fight, which is why it's so important because they're saying, "Oh well, you know, if he'd maybe if he'd if he'd had the less seconds, if Tony had had the less seconds in that round, he would have been able to finish him, or maybe he wouldn't have made the count." But what is controversial is Tony then floors Dempsey in the very next round, and the referee doesn't wait for. Tunney to retreat mm-hmm. before beginning the count. Now, again, uh, the fighter makes the count, but it's about it was applying a different standard. It seems to be in the next round for the other fighter. So that's what's kind of controversial. But the actual first part, I don't think, is that controversial. And making it less controversial still, after the fight, um, Tunney said that he could have risen sooner. But obviously, it makes sense tactically to wait until nine to rise. Give yourself max recovery. Absolutely, yeah. So that's what Tunney said he was doing. And Dempsey said of this, I have no reason not to believe him. Gene's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh. So, so that's that one. Pretty yeah, nice. Pretty huh? nice. Yeah, I like it. Pretty, pretty nice. So, so there we go. The long count, controversial, but not really that controversial because he knew the rules and he just didn't, uh, didn't in the heat of the battle apply them properly or listen to the referee enough. And could it have made a difference to the fight? Possibly. Right. As that one cleared up, you're welcome, listeners. In case anyone wasn't quite a hundred percent on that one, you're welcome. I've got a really interesting one, right? Um, which it comes from. Lewis v. McCall, the rematch, okay? Ah, yes. Now, this one is probably one of the strangest things I've ever seen in my entire (laughs) life, right? And so, um, this one, Lewis is fighting McCall in the rematch, right? And he's, like, he's controlling the first three rounds with a strong jab and, like, landing the occasional kind of right hand, right? McCall... Uh really didn't offer very much defense and like only landed 26 punches through the course of the fight. Mm -hmm. Right. Then Mm -hmm. after the third round, McCall refuses to return to his corner, ignoring the pleas of his trainer, George Benton. And instead like starts walking around the ring until the fourth round begins. Right. Then, yeah, I remember seeing it. <laughs> as the fourth round begins, 
Lewis lands a right hook to the side of McCall's head, followed by like a, a right left combo um, that just uh-huh. misses. Then McCall drops his gloves and backs away from Lewis into the ropes. And then as Lewis approaches him, McCall then turns his back and then just walks aimlessly around the ring. And like <laughs> Lewis tries to engage him a few times, but McCall like refuses to fight back. And spends the mm-hmm. entire round just walking around the ring, covering up when Lewis approaches him, trying not to land a single punch. Um, mm-hmm. As the round ends, McCall refuses to go back to his con- his corner and then walks around the ring. Um, Mills Lane again talks to McCall, who's now sort of crying. <laughs> Yeah, he's in his broken down. <laughs> totally he? broken down. Uh, and, like, Lane s- starts talking to McCall's corner about what's going on and stuff like that and why McCall is crying. <laughs> and then just as, like, the fifth round begins, McCall, like, continues not to fight back, even though, like, Lewis is, like, landing several power punches on him. And McCall then turns his back and begins to walk away. And so La- Mills Lane just, like steps in, stops the fight, and then says it's like a TKO. Mm -hmm. Um, But, like, it gets even more bizarre than this because the press conference the next day, McCall tries to explain his actions, and he says Uh that his refusal to engage Lewis was a type of -of rope-a-dope strategy, and and his crying uh, was because he wanted to get himself into an emotional state. That is a shame. So the Nevada Athletic Commission temporarily suspends him and withholds his $3 million purse. Mm -hmm. Um, He was deemed mentally ill and sent to a psychiatric ward. Um, And then in 1997, he was deemed healthy enough to continue boxing and his suspension was lifted, but he finally got his purse, albeit with a $250,000 fine. And, like, the, the stuff is on YouTube. It's the most bizarre shit you've ever seen in your entire life. Yeah, I have, I have watched it, yeah. It's just, it's just when he's walking around, like, weeping, and you're like, what is actually going on? Because, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly there's some, there's some demons in there, isn't Fuck there? Fuck, demons. <laughs> so weird. So weird. It's just because uh, obviously he won the he he'd beaten Lewis in the first fight, yeah. was it? which was a big upset. But I tell you what, in the heavyweight division in the nineties, there were some absolute crackers boxers about the yeah. place. There was him, there was Galotta, who was off his rocker. There was our friend Bebabuchi. Yeah. The- <laughs> you know, you had all these like larger than life, like total like um, I don't know. Crazy, that's a bit unfair, but not, not jobs really, but just like total crazy guys in, in the 90s in the heavyweight division. It was very colourful. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite, I'm quite glad that, uh, you know, we are living in, a, in an age that's a bit more sane, right? Not completely sane, but like you don't have boxers crying their eyes out in fucking boxing matches. Like, it's weird as fuck. It's weird as fuck. <laughs> It's just so strange. Uh, I can't believe he went back to fight. Yeah, I know. I'm surprised, like, they even let him. But, like, obviously there was problems because he was, like, admitted to a mental institute afterwards. Uh, Cool. Yeah, Yeah. do you want to move on? Yeah, I've got a really quick one for you. Okay. Really quick one here. This is quite interesting. You know, we've talked about how... um, he went on boxing too long, but goes down as one of the one of the best, in certainly in, or in recent years and probably of all time. Roy Jones. Oh, Jr. indeed, yeah. Nineteen eighty-eight Seoul Olympics, Park Si Hoon. He fights. Yep. Jo- <laughs> Jones dominates the fight, landing eighty-six punches to thirty-two, but somehow loses the fight <laughs> three-two to, to, me, man. <laughs> to Park. <laughs> Afterwards, you know you've been wronged when your opponent apologizes to you for being yeah, there, totally. Which is what happened there. You know you're also been wronged when one of the judges comes out and later says that they made a mistake. And you know you've also been wronged when the two of the aforementioned judges are banned for life and have been found to be coerced by uh, by South Korean officials. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is literally uh, a perfect example of. 
a robbery of a result. So, I mean, it was. I don't think there's anyone that legitimately thought Roy Jones Jr. didn't win the fight. It was just like it wasn't even. It wasn't even close. It wasn't even contentious. It was like no, he's won this fight comprehensively, and then he didn't get awarded <laughs> it. Too. Oh, so good. That's so good. So there we go. But he made up for it. He got over it. Right. My next one is uh, going back in time again, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. The Alley Phantom Punch. Mm. So we've talked about this a little bit before in our um, Who the F is Muhammad Ali episode. Um, Mm -hmm. But Ali versus Liston 2. Big rematch in 1965. Uh Um, And... This ended real quick, right? So, uh, <laughs> and, like, Ali starts out, right, dancing, doing some shadow, hunting of Liston, doesn't hit him. And then the final moments of the first round, like, Ali strikes him, quote unquote, with hard right to the head. Mm-hmm. Liston goes down. Ali's sitting there mm-hmm. going, like, get up, get the fuck up. And then uh, the, the referee actually waved off the fight. Immediately, mm-hmm. right, people questioned it. Because actually, like, yeah. you can watch some of it on YouTube. It's quite hard because, like, obviously the footage is not in HD. But, like, <laughs> it's, it's whether or not, like... Are you joking? I'm not, I'm not watching it if it's not in HD. Fuck that. But, like, it, like it, it looks like it doesn't even hit Sonny Liston. But there's, like... A lot of questions about whether or not it had to do with, like, um, actually the mob telling Liston to throw the fight yeah. because he, he owed the money. And then, like, you know, obviously not long later, he dies in very, in a very suspicious heroin overdose. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it is. I would urge everyone to go and watch the, the footage because, like, you can watch it, like, four or five times and you're like, it's, it's like a real pawing shot. And, like, Liston makes a fucking meal out of it, right? Yeah. And, like, you you kind of go, actually, like, he didn't really get hit that hard, but he's, like, on the floor fucking done. It's a weird one. Yeah. It's a real weird one. And the fact, obviously, Ali is saying to him to get up as if he knows. Yeah, Yeah, totally. You know, Mm -hmm. so. Mm. Interesting. Indeed. Uh, I heard that there was one of the the other theories was that either because he was in debt to the mob mm-hmm. that he'd bet on himself to lose the fight. Oh, shit. You know, through, through, through someone that he'd bet that he was going to get beat. So that's kind of one of the right. reasons. Right. But, I mean, obviously, that's kind of... But it was this whole thing about the mob, about being intertwined with the mob, mm-hmm. certainly uh, was quite... There was quite a lot of chat about that, wasn't there? Sugar Ray Leonard versus Tommy Hearns, 1989. Now, this fight was again one of these like mega fights and it was always going to be like a classic given the sort of the styles of the two fighters and and they didn't disappoint in the end the fight was scored a draw it was scored 113-112 Hearns 113-112 Leonard and 112-112 now the controversy with this is that one of the judges scored the 12th round 10-8 to Leonard Right. right, and what's co- controversial about that is that that was a close round, which could have gone either way, and neither fighter was knocked down. What? I know. So do you think he's gone? Uh, I'm supposed to make this a draw. Uh, ten eight last round, even though it makes no that sense. That makes no it's sense. Like, it makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. Because there's no reason to deduct a point unless someone's fucking. The, there wasn't a point deducted. As, yeah, there was not a, so the only way you can score at ten eight is if there's like a knockout or it's like equivalent domination yeah. to, to sorry, not a knockout to a knockdown. So it's it most likely is it's bent. Yeah. That sounds so fucking bent. It's so fishy. But um because that because of the way that was scored, uh Leonard afterwards declared that Hearns was the winner of the fight, even though it was scored as a draw officially, he said no no, Hearns did win the fight. So I thought that was pretty uh, amazing. Yeah, really. totally, totally. But that's the stuff of legends, and he's a legend. What do you want? Amazing. Uh, but imagine a boxer doing that now. Never, never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. Not, uh, not one of that kind of level. You wouldn't have thought. But anyway, yeah, I thought it was quite interesting. So uh, bizarre referee. Oh, sorry, bizarre judging for that one. 
Uh, I have an honorable mention, uh, and it's honorable because like it's it's so recent, but it's caused a huge amount of controversy on social media. Uh huh. Um, which is the final round of Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder. Uh, n- not only mm-hmm. because, like, you know, obviously Fury kind of gets knocked down out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. The, the, the ending is a draw, but also there's all these question marks about if the, re- the ref counted too long and how it yeah. worked. You know, so there there are arguments that like, you know, to be, you know, well, you can count for 10 seconds and he he was slow, but also like you're not that, you know, it's also people not understanding how actually a 10 count works. So it's a 10 count, uh-huh. not a 10 second time limit, but it set uh-huh. the internet on absolute fire. But I mean, also Tyson Fury, uh, in my opinion, and when I watched it and scored it with, even though he got knocked down twice... He still won the fight because he won almost yeah. every other round, barring the two that he got knocked down in. Yep, um, agree. You know, so I mean, I've just thought we had to mention it because actually, in the kind of zeitgeist of boxing, this is a super controversial fight. This, in in like the next generation, when we pass the torch on Ryan, the next generation who are doing the equivalent of our podcast will be talking about the Wilder Fury fight like in the same way that we talked about you know Tyson Holyfield oh absolutely that'll be it'll it'll be in the the, this will be the the next generation to carry on to carry on the legends and they'll be able to watch it in HD (sighs) of course they fucking will yeah (laughs) (laughs) right I've got one more right one more going going back in time talking about HD we don't have SD we don't have NED let's go back to 1810 Jesus Christ, man! Is this even a thing that happened? Was it written on parchment? Yeah, no. This is a, this is a thing that happened. Um, one of the first, I think, uh, it was like super fights, uh, and it happened in the UK. The ones that captured the public's attention and the public's imagination: the British champion Tom Cribb versus the American challenger Tom Molyneux. Right. Now, this is how far back we're going. Molyneux. <laughs> is a, a freed ex plantation slave from Virginia. <laughs> oh, that's class. Okay. Now, you, uh, I remember you did a, the research for one of our very earlier vintage episodes um, about the, the time scale for the implementation of different uh, boxing standards. Yes. Like, what is it, the Queensbury, etc.? Yes. So. Um, 1810 is still the era of bare knuckle fighting. So, this is hard. These boys are hard. Super hardcore. hardcore. Okay. Super hardcore. Molyneux, the the former slave, uh took a boat um he so I should say one of the one of the things that he did as a, when he was a plantation slave was was fight. So the 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 plantation owners used to pit their best uh, best slaves against each other in in fighting contests to see who was the the double hardest. Naturally, and, and I think that <laughs> naturally, yes, it's unbelievable. And Molyneux was one of the. I think it, it helped him being freed that he he had for some time been a been the sort of champion uh, plantation mm-hmm, fighter, mm-hmm. if you like. Now, so he came to the UK because in the in the US at that point, boxing was not particularly revered or or like popular or mainstream, but it was more so in the UK. So he came to the UK, pretty much penniless, and eventually found um, another uh, black American who I think was a tavern owner in London, and he kind of got in with them and got to do some some prize fighting. So. He stood at five foot eight, was about about two hundred pounds, basically all muscle, and he could bang. He, he could bang. He quickly dispatched a series of challengers on uh, on British shores, and, and sort of gathered more and more more attention as he was getting on. Until one one fight happened where he basically fought the undisputed uh, British champion, who was Tom Cribb, and he was. He was so uh, so successful that he'd kind of run out of viable opponents and there was no one thought that could really challenge his dominance, such were his boxing skills. Um, so they fought 
in East Grimstead in Sussex in the cold and the rain of December, and a crowd of 5,000 turned out to watch. Fuck! Okay. They, they fought bare knuckle for 39 rounds before the fight concluded. Jesus, man. Jesus Christ. That is intense. So they were, uh, and here's the so the controversy. There are two points of controversy. Um, according to the rules, you're not uh, you don't have to break them. But Molyneux was holding had Crib pinned for a lengthy amount of time, kind of again slash over the ropes, and he was kind of like hugging him, pinning him there, where some of the crowd ran up and kind of prized Crib's, uh, sorry Molyneux's hands off Crib to free him, mm-hmm. but in the process of doing so, he had one of his fingers broken. So that put him at a slight disadvantage and it made him very angry. But, but the, the biggest controversy was at the end of the 28th round, Cribb's manager started accusing, came into the ring and started accusing Molyneux of holding actually bullets in his hands, therefore making his punches harder. Um, so he, he made this big show about accusing him and saying Molyneux was cheating. Now, he didn't actually think he was cheating, but it was all a big ruse to buy some more time for Crib, who looked very much, at the end of the 28th round, of uh, being in danger of not making the count, not returning. You have to, so in the back in the old days, I'm sure you remember, you have to, you have to get to the line, effectively. Mm-hmm. You have to come back out to fight for the next yeah. round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he looked, he looked like he was um, not maybe going to make it. But but this arguing and his manager's intervention bought him more time, and it seemed to give him a little bit more energy when he rose, um, and he went on after thirty nine rounds to win the contest. What was the most one of the most brutal brutal contests in in all of boxing? He won uh, the fight when when Molyneux said he could he could return no more. Fucking apparently. Him. By the end, their faces were so badly mutilated that you could only tell them apart actually by looking at their skin colour on the rest of their bodies. Jesus, man. That is fucking mental. (laughs) It is mental. It is mental. Um, So they're saying about whether or not, if it wasn't for the intervention, whether if it had been totally fair, whether Molyneux might have won it. They did have a rematch, Mm -hmm. but by that point, um, this this is kind of an aside, there wasn't so much controversy with it, but Molyneux kind of got a bit of fame and notoriety, obviously, after the first fight and and didn't take his sort of dietary and training requirements seriously enough. Yeah. And Crib, on the other hand, engaged in the build-up to the rematch in probably what was by a huge distance the most advanced kind of training fitness camp for a boxing fighter for the next like hundred years he, he actually he had like a sponsor who was this like captain estate owner and the guy like basically imposed uh like a fitness health nutritional regimen mm-hmm. on him so crib came into the, the rematch in the best condition and molyneux in the worst and crib uh, after a sort of close few rounds went on to dominate and stopped him in a much much more quick time he 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 at various points gave Molyneux more time, so he said no no don't count him out you know don't call it quits don't call it, I want him to get up again so that he can inflict more punishment. Fuck. Uh, which he which he did several times and it was seen as kind of uh, the invader versus the kind of this uh, like epitome of kind of British dominance <laughs> and uh, and then that's how it went. Down. Fucking hell, man! What a story! What a story! I know. I know it could be all bullshit. No one, no one. There's no photos. <laughs> no photos, man. No photos. <laughs> Just made it up. <laughs> Just made it up. There we go. Right, guys. Well, that is our episode of what the f are boxing biggest controversies. Tell us what you think about our new episode layouts. Right. We really need the feedback. If you want us to go back, if this is kind of like when Iron Brew changed and took all the sugar out. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean let us know right if you want old yeah, formula I, iron brew back we'll bring it back yeah. right is this new is this new boxing unwrapped like new coke or new pepsi or whatever it was is this, is this like the new but not improved version or is it now even better bite size yum yum gobble gobble gobble, gobble right <laughs> <laughs> so let us know right uh via the facebook page or whatever leave us some comments and and what have you right um but with that in mind it's goodbye from me ryan and goodbye from me andrew